Good evening, church, and happy Wednesday to you. Uh, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is our first session of a Lenten study that I got from Cokesbury, so a huge thank you to them. They uh, sent me uh, about uh, four books that had companion videos uh, that went along with it for the Lenten season, and after looking through and praying through the, the studies, I, I've chosen seven words, listening to Christ from the Cross by Pastor Susan Robb. Very excited about this. Uh, it spoke to me uh, as I know that it will uh, speak to you. So let me open up with a word of prayer and then we will uh, begin our first session in this Lent season. Let us go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God, we're going to be looking at your Son, our Savior's seven Words. Seven words, O oh God, that I hope can ring in our ears. Lord, I pray that these words, in fact, can teach us, that they can fill us, Lord, that they can uh, bring us hope and that they can, in fact, help uh, to redeem us as well. Bless this study. Bless those who are watching, Lord, this Lenten study. May uh, this season, the season of Lent, be a blessing. May this study be a blessing. Lord, we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, folks, I'm going to invite you to uh, turn now to your uh, Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 32 and 34. I'd like to read uh, this scripture and then go back and, and offer some, some content. Luke 23, verses 32 through 34. Father, forgive them. Hear now this text. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with them. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks. Be to God. So I just wanted to offer a, a few things about what uh, Pastor Rob has uh, given to us just to kind of set up this, this first uh, chapter about uh, Father, forgive them. Well, the, the first set of words here. Uh, so if you would uh, take note and uh, hear, uh, hear now these these words. Jesus' last words uttered as he was dying on Good Friday offers us the opportunity to lean in and listen closely for messages that are for us today, not just for the reader or listener or audience then when it was happening in real time, but for you and I uh, today in this Lenten season. These statements collected from the various gospel accounts have traditionally been called the seven last words of Jesus. Christ's words become, for us, not merely dying words, but words that show us how to live. That's very important. Write that down. They are messages. They are words of hope. And I want us to hold on to that. They point the way as we seek to carry out the mission that we undertake when we commit to following Him and lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Now, one might wonder why each gospel writer included such differing last words. Why wouldn't each writer record all of Jesus' statements, right? Pastor Rob says, I believe that these statements are not contradictory 
but that each author chose to represent Jesus' particular message or messages for the benefit of their own particular community. In addition, each of those authors would have had access to reports of various witnesses to Jesus' crucifixion. Those witnesses would not have included all of the same information or even details, just as witnesses to a crime or an earth-shaking event will report their own details differently, right? It's an eyewitness account, so it is going to be different. Briefly, briefly now, let's look at each of Jesus' seven last words. This is important here take these down because this is what we're going to be building toward every week. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Today, you will be with me in paradise. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Woman, here is your son. Here is is your mother. I am thirsty. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And it is finished. It is from the cross as Jesus breathes his last breath and speaks his last words that his deep trust in the Father and his divine glory are revealed. And it is in the example of the cross that Christ calls us into a life where we find God's kingdom through love that is willing to give freely of itself to others. The reality is that preparing for the joy of Easter by walking with Jesus through his last days and taking time to stand by him and listen to his words from the cross, this is important, offers a depth of understanding and spiritual power that one simply cannot experience by moving only from joy to joy. Now, think about this, okay, because there are many faith traditions that do not have a season called Lent, a 40-day period, okay? Think about that, take note of that, and hear this. To skip the cross and focus only on Easter is like wanting to bypass all of the months of training and sacrifice it takes to prepare for a marathon and to go straight into the elation of crossing the finish line. Without training and conditioning, we won't make it, just as the training is a necessary part of the journey by which we are able to reach the end of the race. The cross is a part of our journey, individually and as a corporate body, because we have a goal in mind, and that goal is Easter. It's a part of our journey toward being able to say when we reach our end, it is finished. I have completed the mission you gave me, or as the Apostle Paul would say, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give me on that day. That being from 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. So, having said that, kind of built now toward chapter 1, here are these words, the first set of Jesus' final words. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Let uh, the scripture, Luke 23, 32, and 34, be your guide there. So, just a couple of things here. For those who knew the Jewish scriptures, there was a much hoped for and welcomed sign. Through this single prophetic action, riding a donkey from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, Jesus announced that he was the expected Messiah. 
come to save Israel, fulfilling the words of the mighty prophet from the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. You can go there for a reference point. Every devout Jew who saw him would have known what Jesus' prophetic action meant. Excitement swelled, as did the crowd, as the city buzzed with the news of Jesus' presence. Joyful followers paved the road. Jesus traveled with their cloaks as they shouted from Luke 19.38, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Others wave palm branches and join the chorus with Hallelujah and Hosanna to the Son of David, from Matthew 29, 21, 9. At least some among the crowd hope for a military king, a new David, to deliver the people from their enemies. In this case, the hated Roman occupiers. Jesus is a king, all right, but not the kind of king that many had hoped for. Now, Rome would treat Jesus as it had so many other rabble-rousers of the day. Death by crucifixion. A horrific death. Some of the religious leaders convinced that no one worth following would come from a backwater town like Nazareth. Saw Jesus as a usurper, a blasphemer. Others, more conflicted about his identity, saw his signs and miracles as evidence that he had been sent by God, but also worried that if Jesus were allowed to continue, what do you think would happen? The authority of the day, the Romans, would in fact destroy them all, as Rome had a tendency to do. They would suppress and destroy their opponents. The crowds that cheered Jesus' entry into the city played right into the fears of Pilate and Herod and worked in the religious authorities' favor. What we do know is that Pilate became fearful when the religious leaders told him, and this comes from John 19, 12, what we do know is that Pilate became fearful when the relig religious leaders told him this, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. There it is, that friction, that opponent there. In the end, what happened? As the scriptures tell us, Pilate capitulated, literally washing his hands of the whole affair. So the Gospel writer Luke, he spares us the gory details, but Jesus is in fact treated as the other criminal, slated for execution by crucifixion. He's beaten and flogged, he's spat upon and ridiculed, he's stripped of his clothing, he's led away to the place of execution, a hill appropriately named the Skull for the features of its rock formation. There he is crucified with two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Luke devotes as much space to what Jesus has to say from the cross as he does to the other details of the crucifixion. It's no coincidence. He wants us, as readers, receiving the gospel message from him to lean in and to listen, starting with a jaw-dropping statement about radical forgiveness. Here we go. Father... Forgive them. But who are they? Very important here. Who are they? The them, the they. From the cross, the instrument of his execution and pain, Jesus speaks words that reflect the depth of God's love. Very important. And God's desire for all of humanity. Did you catch it? He lives out the words in death, that he taught in his sermon on the plain. Here's a scripture reference. Luke chapter 6, 
verses 27 and 28, verse 32, and verses 35 and 36. Let me read it here. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who abuse you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. But love your enemies. Do good. Your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So instead, He begins to pray, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. From Luke chapter 23, verse 24. His prayer then raises one obvious question. Who are they? The soldiers who nailed Jesus to a cross? Maybe. And who were just doing their job? Or maybe it was the crowd, for whatever reason, was given a choice and yet demanded Jesus' execution. Could it be them? Could it be Herod who treated Jesus with nothing but contempt? Could it be Pilate, who with crumbling convictions refused to stand firm against the swelling tide of the crowd's desires? Could it be the religious leaders, who surely would have been horrified had they understood their responsibility in killing the long-awaited Messiah? Could it be Judas, the betrayer? Could it be Peter, the denier? The answer, of course, is all of the above. All of the above. But here's the other caveat. This is controversial, but hear me out. Pastor Rob unpacks this further. It's us as well. It's us as well, the believers today. You see, she goes on to say, we help crucify Jesus when we get caught up in the crowd mentality and say or condone things that go against what we profess to believe and are called to practice as Jesus followers. Things we would never say or condone if we were standing alone. We assessed in crucifying Jesus when, like Pilate, we fell to stand up for what we know is right and rationalize to ourselves the doing of wrong. We crucified Jesus little by little when we fell to have regard for how our words and our deeds harm others, putting our own interests above others. And when we don't grasp the depth of the ways in which we break the hearts of those we love. So, if we're being honest with ourselves, we need to recognize our everyday betrayals of Jesus. Try wrapping your head for a moment around that. Jesus does not wait until after the triumph of his resurrection to think about forgiveness. That's a great point there. He does not wait for those who had a hand in his betrayal, torture, and death to repent. He asked the Father to forgive his killers even as he is being killed himself. He injects forgiveness into the worst act that any human being could possibly have committed, the murder of his own son. In the process, Jesus leaves open the door to repentance, okay? He says this. He says that his killers, all of them, all of us, should not be forever defined. Very important here. I'm going to say this twice. Should not be forever defined by the worst thing that they ever did. When we understand that, then we begin to grasp the power of the gospel. Hear this again. In the process, Jesus leaves open the door to repentance, to make a change, to turn around, to leave the sin, the brokenness, the hurt, the pain, to leave it. 
He leaves open the door to repentance. He says that his killers, all of them, all of us, should not be forever defined by the worst thing that they ever did. When we understand that, then we begin to grasp the power of the gospel. Powerful stuff. So, a Jesus lesson. Those for whom an impossible debt has been canceled will have a greater appreciation of the power of forgiveness than someone whose debt was in fact smaller in size. Learning to say, I'm sorry, for instance, is important not only for fostering and healing relationships with friends and family, but also for fostering a deeper spiritual life as well. When our words or actions bring harm to other persons, it's important to acknowledge them and ask for forgiveness. Do we do that? Do we have a habit of doing that? Do we even think about that spiritual element? If we don't, then we should. Just as important is adjusting our actions so that those harmful behaviors aren't repeated. Do we do that? Do we make those tweaks and adjustments? If we don't, if we don't care, we need to rethink that. The biblical term for this is repentance. To repeat, to repent rather, literally means to turn around or to go in a different direction. It means turning from harmful behaviors to ones that are loving. It's what the prodigal son does, literally and figuratively, when in the depth of his misery, he decides to what? Turn around and go home to his father. Man, woman, coming home to the father. A homecoming. Redemption. Reconciliation. Biblically, it means turning back toward God and the behaviors that reflect the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. John the Baptist calls this, or called this bearing fruits worthy of repentance. Let me move on. We find our forgiveness at the foot of the cross, where Jesus experienced our humanity at its very worst. He offered his life and spoke the world-changing words, Father, forgive them. The question is not whether we can find forgiveness. The question is whether we will, in fact, accept it, right? And, in the process, accept God's invitation into a life that is marked by love, mercy, and grace. So what does it mean to imitate Jesus? Some have wondered why Jesus would have prayed, Father, forgive them, when elsewhere in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus directly forgives people's sins. Jesus says to the paralyzed man who was brought to him for healing, in quotes, Friend, your sins are forgiven you, Luke 5, 20. He says of the sinful woman who crashed the dinner party, in quotes, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Chapter 7, verses 47 and 48. So I forgive you because you don't know what you are doing. One reason Jesus said this is that Jesus' actions were meant to fulfill Scripture, which we see throughout the Gospels, Him even saying those words. The prophet Isaiah says of the suffering servant, He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Go to Isaiah 53, 12 for that text. And this is the hard part. It may be that Jesus prays to the Father to set an example for Followers who suffer innocently and unjustly. You see, being followers of Jesus means that there's an expectation that we too forgive those who have wronged us. 
And here's the rub. That just doesn't mean small transgressions, like a cutting word said in jest, or someone being inconsiderate, out of ignorance. It is a call to highlight this word, radical forgiveness. A willingness not to define our enemy solely by an act so painful to us that the hurt may never completely go away. You know, there are times when even though we know that we are called to forgive, we struggle when it involves someone who has done us great harm. Yet sometimes our most painful experiences can in fact be catalysts to bring healing to others and to ourselves. Still, there's the question of how. We sometimes wonder if we could offer the same kind of forgiveness if we experienced such harm, especially if the one who harmed us remains unrepentant. Sometimes in our own struggle, amid our pain, the best we can do is to pray for those who injured us, to let ourselves believe that, even though their sin may have been conscious or even premeditated, just as Jesus' killers knew they were killing him. They did not truly understand the import of their actions. In closing, forgiveness does not mean that you submit yourself to further abuse. It means that you will not allow past hurts to control or define your life, just as you were willing not to let other persons' transgressions against you forever define the totality of who they are. During this season of Lent, when we practice self-sacrifice in remembrance of Jesus' journey to the cross, I invite you to practice the difficult discipline of forgiveness. First, think of someone you need to forgive. If forgiving is difficult for you, try praying for that person. And pray for the ability to act in a way that is forgiving. I'm not as good as Jesus, the pastor right? Sometimes anger and bitterness, even when I thought I'd completely let go, rear their ugly heads again, and I have to keep praying and offering forgiveness as many times as 70 times 7, as Scripture tells us. Forgiveness is not always a once and forever done deal the way it is for Jesus, but it can get better and better until forgiveness is complete. Forgiveness is a process, church. Forgiveness doesn't happen just with a snap of the finger. But are we putting the effort, the trust, the time, the discipline that it takes to forgive someone that has wronged us? Wronged us? Jesus did. Jesus did. I hope that we can trust and obey Jesus, his life, his teachings, the example that he prepared and showed us for this journey of Lent and for life itself. It's a process, folks. But let us start and start somewhere with forgiveness. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are thankful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross for each and every one of us so that we might be justified and forgiven. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive us. We turn our hearts to Jesus for forgiveness so that we might be given the holy power to forgive others. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you folks. Have a great evening. Take care. Folks, I'd like to uh, make a plug for the video that goes along with uh, the Seven Words uh, study book this Lenten season. The videos for Seven Words, Listening to Christ from the Cross, is available on Amplify Media. Amplify, think of that as the Netflix of the Cokesbury uh, Bible studies and other media that they provide. For your code, just click on the link 
in the emails for the studies. It will be a blessing to you. Take care and God bless you.